Martin North. John Adams, in the interest of the people. Hello, John. Hello, sir. So there's some funny things going on in the banking sector at the moment. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I mean, look, I think it's the banking sector, the the, the economic regulators, uh, institutions, and the government. Um, it seems that per selection, um, everyone's uh, you know feeling buoyant. Everyone's full flowing back into property. Um, we're seeing uh, some interesting behavioural trends in, in some banks, uh, um, and, and you know there seems to be not a worry in the world. And it seems that we're on a kamikaze course towards a crisis, and yet everyone continues to just say everything's great and let us just continue on the path that we were doing before the election. Yeah, and indeed, uh, I've noticed that around 300 uh, loans are now reduced. The interest rates have been reduced ahead of expected rate cuts. Yes, so yes. Everyone's getting excited, you know, the market's going to be buoyant. Now's the time to get back in the market, get in quick. Yes, yes. And, and, and you know, I, I saw some information last week. I mean, I was on the phone. Uh, I think we said this in a couple of videos ago. Uh, I spoke to, uh, uh, in terms of brokers, I've spoken to real estate agents. Uh, uh, you know, I've spoken to uh, people in the property development game. And they're all seeing, saying that there is a, there's a buzz now back in the market. There's, a, there, there's hype. There's increased um, enthusiasm. A lot of people are jumping back in the market. We saw yesterday um, uh, the ABC report that Commonwealth Bank uh, said that in the week after the election, they had the highest rate of mortgage applications in, in, in a six month period. So obviously the banks are starting to see a flood of people who were nervous about the ALP and their tax policies now all rushing back into the market. Mm. Yeah, and I've also independently validated that there's a higher rate of applications now than before the election. But in a way, you'd sort of expect that, right? Because people were hanging around thinking that Labour might get in, and if they Labour got in, then effectively negative gearing and, and all the other stuff would actually put a damper on the market. So that's come off. But there's more than that happening, I think, more than just the election sentiment. Y yeah, yes, yes, yes. So, so obviously we, we have... The, you know, we have the sentiment, we have the announcement of the 5% deposit scheme that will come in on 1 January 2020, we have the APRA changes, uh, we have the proposed rate cuts, um, and we'll have more to say in a future post about that. But, you know, people were speculating a quarter point, uh, some people saying, no, the RBA has gone half a percent. Then Westpac a couple of days ago saying um, half a percent is not going to cut it. You need to go three cuts in 2019 to 0.75. And then today, JP Morgan says, hey, why don't we go for the whole hog? Let's go a full 1% in the next 12 months to half a percent. And indeed, let's go to zero straight away and then do quantitative easing and helicopter money. You know, And negative interest rates. <laughs> exactly, yes. That's, and what amazes me is that three months ago, Everyone was saying, we've got such a wonderfully strong economy, there's no issues at all, right? Well, if that was true, then all this conversation around zero interest rates, quantitative easing and all the rest of it would make no sense. So something's changed. So what well, well, they are saying, well, what is change or what, you know, what are the headwinds? The headwinds are coming from overseas. Um, you know, it's, it's Deutsche Bank, it's, the, it's what's happening in China, it's the Italians, it's what's happening in the US corporate bond market. The, these are the things that are um, sort of are making everyone nervous. But the, the, the whole scam with this whole line of questioning is, is that these policy measures would be required once those things blow up, but they're doing it before it blows up. Why? Because our domestic bubble is the biggest on record. Um, and, it, and, and in the first quarter, of 2019, it was falling apart big time. Right. So that then puts the acid back on bank lending standards, doesn't it? Because yes. We know that post the Royal Commission and post APRA's interventions over the last couple of years, lending standards have been tightened, right? And that people were able to get less by way of a loan for the same amount of income and expenditure. Exactly. Now the question is, is that changing? Yes, yes. So, so, so the, the whole linchpin of does the bubble fall apart or continue in this country, independent of the rest of the world, is what happens with credit growth. Yep. So according to the RBA, annual, annualised credit growth to housing is at 4%. Um, uh, on Friday this week, we'll see what the, what the uh, number for last month was. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, the, but, the, but there is, you know, uh, if, if you now UBS and some others have said, no, uh, credit growth is going to go to about zero, 
um, and it's all going to fall apart. There are others who say that, no, uh, it's going to either stabilize or even go up. And uh, funny enough, Mr. Insider Christopher Joy, in my debate with him, said, no, credit growth will go back up. And, and we're starting to see some interesting evidence as to why he may have had the inside running on this. Uh, now, we won't know if it has or it hasn't, but but uh, let me let me re- relay a, a, an amazing story. Um, I've heard this, and we just had a phone call with the source, and you've heard the same story. Yep. So um, it's, it's a unique magic trick in the banking industry that they've just rolled out in the last week. So here is a story. A, a mortgage broker in Melbourne um, uh, had nine in nine mortgage applications for investors. These investors were seeking uh, loans between 650,000 to 1.1 million. They went to, uh, so this mortgage broker took all the details, submitted them to the banks before the Royal Commission, uh, so before the election, and the banks rejected all nine applications. So uh, the, you know, uh, so, so this mortgage broker works for a mortgage uh, aggregator and the aggregator in, uh, encouraged uh, this broker and other brokers to um, go back to the banks with any failed applications in the last 12 weeks before the election. So, so this broker did this last week. Um, I've been told exactly the same information. Incomes didn't change, expenses, expenses didn't change, assets, liabilities, uh, every single thing was identical. And they put the applications in and magically six of the nine that were rejected before the election have now been uh, have now been approved. And this mortgage broker was as happy as Larry um, because of his good fortune, because obviously he gets a very big um, upfront commission with each of the loans and he got six approved. Now, when I heard this, I thought, you know, s- s- something has to be fishy here because I mean, Apple has announced this change on the 7% rule, but they said they're going to do four-week consultation. Mm. And, and so the, 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 the rule should change by the end of uh, June um, 2019. And so the rate cuts hasn't, uh, hasn't start, have, haven't begun. And I thought to myself, well, how did the banks all of a sudden approve six when they rejected before the election? So I actually caught up a, a friend of mine in Sydney. So this was a Melbourne store. I've got a mortgage broker in Sydney who's a friend of mine, very close friend. And I called him up and I said... Um, what have you done with failed applications? Have you resubmitted and did you get a different result? And he said, there's no point. This is, this is what the mortgage broker told me. He said, there's no point in resubmitting failed applications because the lending standards hasn't changed. So I said to him, well, but, but he, I, and I told him the story. And he goes, well, that, 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 that's quite amazing. Uh, but he was actually quite happy because obviously, you know, he, he being in the mortgage uh, broken business, uh, he will get remunerated if he gets more people in debt. Mm. Um, and if the banks are now loosening the credit lines, um, that, that obviously um, is, is good news to him and other people in, the, in his industry. Right. So we should say that your Melbourne case study is, could be a one off. Could be right. one-off. There could be some unique circumstances around those particular applications, like they were very marginal or something. Or it could be that that's a very early indicator of a relaxation of lending rules and lending standards, which will effectively bite further and f- you know, more deeply in the, in the weeks ahead. Because, of course, the application process takes a little bit of time to work through. So we are either on to something very early or it's an aberration. We're not sure which. Yes, yes. And, 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 and so, so, you know, the, the important part of this is, is the, the, the RBA and the government need to get credit growth up. Yep. So if they're going to stabilise the housing market, if they're going to, um, uh, you know, like a, if they're going to execute this uh, covert plan of de- plausible deniability to blame a foreign um, event rather than being held accountable for their domestic economic misdeeds, they need to kick the can down the road. And the only way they can do it is, is by bringing more people into the country um, potential buyers, potential customers, who who could because even on the issue of oversupply, you need people who who can either buy or rent these properties. So this is why a net migration is uh, still at a high. And even though before the election, Morrison said he was going to reduce net migration, Macro Business had an excellent post on their website today, and anyone should um, go have a look at that as to how the Morrison government manipulated the migration numbers uh, by using temporary bridging visas to hide the inflow of migrants. But but the Morrison government is still big on bringing boatloads of people into the country uh, to, to, continue, to, to continue the property Ponzi scheme. Um, but, but they said they need more people and they need more credit. 
And so uh, now it, it's interesting with the CBA CEO, he said at this press conference yesterday uh, that the ABC reported on that we are getting a lot more applications, but he said nothing about the willingness of the bank to lend. Well, we have at least one case, and we should say that in this case, the mortgage broker with these six loans that were rejected and approved, they were not with one institution, they were with multiple institutions. So uh, again, you know, could be a one-off, um, obviously in the Melbourne market. I mean, uh, some of the cross-referencing that I did, and I think you may have done as well, were more in the Sydney market, and we mm. haven't necessarily picked this up in terms of the Sydney market, but, but also our source uh, you know, uh, was, was looking for a, a, an additional line of credit um, and before the election couldn't get the a level of credit he wanted. He went uh, to one of the big four post-election and was given an extra $250,000 uh, you know, in his own unique circumstances. So definitely something happening in the Melbourne market where the banks are now loosening up uh, and they're also uh, willing to have a more free-flowing conversations with uh, property developers with good track records um, uh, in terms of their credit requirements and, and see if they can help uh, fund uh, their uh, ongoing property development. Mm, it's worth saying, I think, that the last reporting season, pretty much all of the banks reported um, very slack lending in the mortgage sector. But it appeared to me that even then they were suggesting they wanted to try and get more business through the front door. So it looks as though perhaps that was also another factor, right? Because their reporting season was a few weeks ago. So that could be something else in, in the mix too. But I guess, guess it goes back to this question then of how do they evaluate a responsible lending situation, right? Correct. Because what, remember that we're in a situation where there is a question about household expenditure measure, which is the sort of the, the, the vague measure that's been used in most of the lending that's been done over recent years. And that was shown to be pretty flawed through the Royal Commission. And we know that in some cases, the banks went to quite rigorous lengths in terms of expenditure and income, you know, 18 categories and longer validation. But there's still the question of the HEM process and whether in fact that will come back and become more dominant again in the application process. Oh, yes, yes. So, 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 you know, I mean, obviously, you know, so before the Royal Commission, uh, I mean, I mean, you had, you saw the banks engage in uh, some very dodgy practices around around mortgage lending. Um, so some of it had to do with expense verification. Some of it had to do with uh, the assessment of incomes. Um, so, uh, but but also, you know, I mean, you, there was also um, some hidden tricks around. Um, uh, telling customers whether they had or had not an interest-only loan. So a lot of stuff was exposed in the Royal Commission. Uh, there was a big question about uh, what is responsible lending. Um, uh, now, obviously, the Commissioner Haynes said we'll leave it to the courts, and we have this, obviously, pivotal uh, landmark case between ASIC and Westpac that uh, they've, they've uh, finished closing arguments and we're waiting for the judge to hand down the, 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 hand down the decision. But, but the case basically on, on, on expenditure, uh, you know, it, it sort of, t it goes to two questions. And the first question is, so is it legal for the banks to use a pre-calculated lending benchmark to assess mortgage applications? Um, uh, and then obviously the, the second element of the case is, um, uh, can banks uh, accept the initial claim of a customer about their expenses and they don't have to do any additional due diligence. So yes, so 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 with these two elements, there are some, you know, there are two uh, key things to consider. One is about what is the state of the law, and then what is, uh, you know, what is a good sound commercial decision. Mm. So, um, so 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 yes, so the, so Westpac says they can use a benchmark, and they don't need to um, actually do full expenditure verification and under the law, um, uh, and they can accept the initial claims of a customer they don't actually have to check. Um, uh, the government via ASIC says they don't accept those two propositions and obviously that is what the judge has to be able to accept. Now, I think you have a view that the way you read the law, Westpac's uh, use of HEM, uh, you know, you think, you think it's likely to be legal and it's likely that the bank will win the case. Um, uh, so, 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 yeah, so... On that, I'm not a lawyer, right? So, but I'm reading the practice guides that ASIC put out 
and the original wording around that, which is that loans must not be unsuitable, right? And unsuitable basically means a loan that's for the purpose that the people want it and that they can afford it, right? So that's the test. There is nothing in the current wording for the practice guides that says specifically thou shalt use a benchmark or thou shalt not use a benchmark, right? And industry practice for a good number of years has been to use a benchmark. Now, we know that that benchmark is deeply flawed. So the chances are that I think Westpac is likely to win this case because there is nothing in the current practice guidelines that says you can't use a benchmark. Right. And, 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 and so, so, so just so we're clear, so with the HEM benchmark, um, you know, you know, for, for a good chunk of customers, the average annual expenditure was assumed to be thirty-four thousand dollars a year, yeah. which was uh, dramatically lower than what the average customer actually the the average customer actually spends. Right. No, absolutely right. So, so the, the second question then is, okay, well, if a benchmark is appropriate, then what is the right benchmark? So one is a process, right, yes. which says I can use some sort of generic measure to, to assess whether, in fact, this is an, a loan that is um, going to be serviceable or not, right? The second then is what is the level of that benchmark? And that's why my expectation is that the banks will actually announce they're going to lift the HEM from its current levels, which are way too low, pretty much everybody accepts that, to a more acceptable level. The question for me is whether asset will accept that or whether they will push for complete expense validation, which is what many of the lenders actually have defaulted to in the meantime for about half of their loans, right? Where they go through these 18 categories and you know ask lots of hard questions, right? That's obviously difficult to do. It takes a lot of time, effort, cost, all those things. And so it comes down to those two questions. One is, is a benchmark of some sort okay? Yes, no. And two, what is the level of the benchmark to be acceptable? Now, ASIC's already said if they lose the case, they want to push back on it and change the law to say, no, a benchmark is not appropriate, right? In other words, you've got to go through a more specific, rigorous process. So that's where the nexus of the conversation is, it seems to me. And the reason it's important is that if, in fact, Westpac were to lose, it would basically open the window for a whole bunch of class actions on loans that were not made responsibly. Y right. Yes, and, and and the point to make there is is that, that we're talking about hundreds of thousands of loans, not just with Westpac yes. and the whole industry. It's industry so, 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 yeah. so yeah, so uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, my, my nemesis Christopher Joy has said publicly that if Westpac loses the case, it will be a catastrophe for the industry. So 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 this I mean this case could could blow up the economy, um, and because there's so much uh, so much um, uh, economically um, is on the table, that's why I think. The Westpac will win the case uh, you know, because because I think someone will make it clear to the judge about if you rule the law in, in a particular way, um, you will actually trigger uh, a domestic Armageddon. The the Irish crisis could could easily be triggered if hundreds of thousands of loans were, were deemed to be made illegal um, uh, because all of those loans would have to be re recalibrated. Massive uh, 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 legal uh, implications for the banks. But also moving forward, it would actually have dramatic implications as to uh, how much additional credit can the banks pump into the system mm. because because it'd be far less than what they were doing before uh, and, and kind of you know, kind of what they're actually doing now. But uh, but but yeah, but, but but this is a decision to come into the future, and yet we still have this magic trick that the banks have pulled out that they have. Uh, somehow approved applications post-election and given additional lines of credit, whereas before the election, uh, they said no way. Mm. Well, you see, here's my theory. Um, you know, I've got no evidence for this, but I'll tell you my theory. I think the banks have deliberately taken it to the extreme to say, I want to go through expense line by line by line by line by line, right? And as a result of that, we've seen the effect, right? The economy has actually slowed. You yes. Know, household expenditure has notched back. The GDP has come down, right? So in a way... The banks are demonstrating to the regulators and to the government that if you really want us to be very tight on credit, this is the impact, right? And what they're going to come back to then is to say, okay, yeah, we'll fine. Well, we need to come back to a middle ground, which will be at a higher level of HEM, which will actually mean they won't need to go through such deep analysis of costs on all of the loans, which opens the door then for more credit growth. Probably not as much as we had prior to the Royal Commission, 
but a lot more than we've currently got now. And that's what I think is actually going on. Well, yes. Yeah, so, so, I mean, so just to add on to that, so I, I think, so my theory is this, Westpac will win the case. Um, uh, you know, the regulator may or may not want to do something about additional regulation. The government's going to lean on the regulator and say no, because we need credit growth back up, because we need to keep this economy buoyant. Um, uh, they will use a revised him initially, um, and when when that is not enough to uh, keep the market stable, uh, the banks, I think, co- privately initially will start to walk away from the revised him um, uh, and, and perhaps go back to pre royal commission. Um, uh, behavior mm. now obviously you know one of the because i was speaking to um um you know uh, a couple of a couple of guys at lf economics this morning um who, who do a lot of analysis about this and i said the key question is what does responsible lending mean under a coalition government compared to a potential alp government and we know that mr morrison is close to the banks they are, he's close to the property sector he has made he has staked his entire prime ministership on this strong economy, on home equity going up, which is something he claimed in the, at, the, at the Liberal Party launch. So this Prime Minister is literally on the hook for the state of the economy, the state of the bubble, for the bubble to get bigger. Um, if he doesn't deliver, he could easily uh, lose his entire Prime Ministership and the, and the government could be in, in shambles within six months. So enormous political pressure will be placed upon the powers that be to, to keep it going. And so... so I think that the what we understand responsible lending to be under one political party is is going to be different compared to another. Now, the law should be the law, but why is this going to be different? It is because the enforcers of the law will be under different instructions because of what is on the what is at stake. Yep. So we can be pretty sure that the debt bubble is going to continue. Yeah, the debt bomb is going to tick even louder. Yes, and for longer. But it hasn't solved anything. All no. it is doing is creating a bigger problem later. Exactly, more debt, more systemic risk. We are sailing into a crisis, um, and everything we are seeing from our elite institutions is basically where we're, 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 they're going to drive us down into the dish. And so that's why I think we have kamikaze elites because. Uh, you know, the kamikaze pilots, they just wanted to kill the enemy and willing to sacrifice themselves. Well, uh, they are willing to sacrifice the middle class and the entire economy just so they don't get blamed for the bubble that they blew up initially. John, thank you very much. Thank you. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of the people, do remember to subscribe and do support us. We'll see you next time.